Um, thank you all for being here um, in our beautiful venue. Um, I have the greatest honor to introduce a family that is very close to my heart. Um, they have all, in many different ways, um, in, inspired me. So um, no doubt they're going to inspire all of you. I might actually introduce um, Olivia. Olivia first. <laughs> so I'm going to let Olivia introduce the four of you and how we're going to roll with this rather than me trying to get through and uh, mumbling my ways around it. But thank you so much for being here, all four of you. A whole generation, four generations of uh, advice we're about to get. Thank you. I'll take thank it. you very much. I'll take it. I guess um, this, isn't, this is not Olivia. <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm going to do a, a short um, a natter um, and then we'll have a, a conversation. I hope genuinely it is a conversation rather than sort of the, 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 the normal panel. So I, I will talk and then I will introduce um, everybody and then I'm going to hand over to Olivia and Olivia will then lead the conversation. And I'll talk for, I don't know, 10 or 12 minutes, but Olivia's got full permission to gong me out um, if I start uh, talking for, for too long. So we're not going to do any singing. There's not going to be stamp family songs. We're not going to sing Do Re Mi. Um, as I said, I'm not wearing lederhosen, as in Sound of Music, which probably is an image now I've put into your heads. You'll be <laughs> deeply grateful to I put that into your head. So, um, yes, um, w we've... Um, We've got this uh, working. So, yes, so normally it would be a parental right to embarrass children by putting up baby pics of them, but I chose one of me uh, instead, um, so that uh, this, is, this is me in the leaves. And, and in a way, uh, it, it's chosen not because it has got an awe factor in it, but, but, but also because I think one of the big themes that well we're all going to be exploring today is going to be the nature of human embodiment, um, what it means to be uh, uh, the sense-making creatures we are after 3.8 billion years of chemical substrate evolution. And I suppose the big theme is what that means in terms of our new and emerging relationship with AI. Um, so, and I've, I've been very struck as, you know, going around the, uh, the site, you know, there's, you're on the ethics stage and there's the sound of a playground in the background and children talking and things. So, in amongst all this conversation, we've had rain, we've had I think they decided to rename this the Meatpacking District for, um, uh, for, 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 the, for COGEX up in this, uh, this part of the world. But that sense of humanness, human embodiment, coming people coming together, all the things that, uh, that sort of make us a communal animal. animal. Um, I'm going to play you a short clip from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I was privileged... Can I just have a very quick show of hands in the room who knows about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Oh, good. I just, that's, it's, it's, it's like shooting vision in a barrel, really, if you come and talk at an AI conference. I was very privileged to know Douglas very well. Um, we had a company together in the early dial-up days of the internet. Uh, we um, created a, a, a website based on the real Earth edition of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy called h2g2.com, which still exists in its own little forgotten spiral of the uh, internet galaxy. And I was privileged to executive produce the movie. Chosen this clip, um, it's a clip where uh, Ford uh, um, and, and Arthur are on the Heart of Gold for the first time. And uh, Marvin the paranoid android has been sent down to collect them. It's only 53 seconds long, and then I'll explain very specifically why I've chosen this clip. I'm a personality prototype. You can tell, can't you? Okay, so Marvin, I, I've chosen Marvin because I think um, Doug, Douglas created so many fabulous memes. Um, and one of them I, 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 I'm just going to share quickly before Marvin. Um, 
if you know your hitchhikers, you'll know the importance of 42. And there's a, I'm on the British Standards Institute Standing Committee for AI. And to my great pleasure, I discovered just recently, I was at a meeting in Paris, the Global Standing Committee for AI. Global is SC42. And I think Douglas would have absolutely loved that. And it was chosen. Apparently, there were English people in the room where 42 could either have gone to the Global Smart Cities Group or to Hitchhikers. <laughs> and it was chosen for Hitchhikers. So SC42. And in another of the great memes, Marvin the Paradoid Android, um, I think we're going to talk about humans, we're going to talk about work, Marvin talking about job satisfaction, the notion of all the anthropomorphization we do of AI, so the notion of paranoid AI, feeling AI, all the sort of some of the, 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 the muddled thinking I think we do about this emerging relationship. Um, and uh, I've just got one little quote here from Marvin talking about the ultimate question to the ultimate answer to life, the universe and everything. Uh, it's, and it's Marvin speaking, it's printed in the Earth man's brainwave patterns, but I don't suppose you'd be interested in knowing that. Arthur Dent, you mean you can see into my mind? Marvin, yes. Arthur Dent, well, Marvin, it amazes me how you managed to live in anything that small. And I think that what we're going to talk about today is in a way how unsmall our embodied self is and what it means to be, to be human. Um, this next slide... <laughs> Three generations. Um, this is a, a family ritual, and I think rituals are very important to human beings. It's a candle, as you can see, Douglas Adams' books, um, not completely coincidentally, but they are genuinely there on that bookshelf at home. And this candle is a, is a candle that we've lit with Sam and Olivia and my wife, who's in the audience as well, pretty much every Christmas since the children were small. And there's a whole ritual about who gets to put the first decoration on the tree and who's lighting the candle. And the candle basically gets lit... Um, when the first sort of decoration goes on the tree, and when the final angel is put on, then it's blown out, and children take it in turns to swap. And I was very struck this year, because you know, my children are now grown up, and you can see how little it's, 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 it's gone down. And I was just thinking, how many generations is that candle as an object, as a ritual object, going to go down? And how strange might the world, if it's being used by great-great-great-grandchildren. So that's when, you know, that's Grandma Olivia and Grandpa Sam are great-great-greats. Because I'm, I'm rubbish at maths. But a few calculations suggested that, you know, that potentially goes down many, many generations. And it was just a, a thought, I think, about the strangeness of the world that I think we're going to inhabit. Um, I've registered a website called Homo Techniensis, which is my neologism for what I think, as we've had Habilis, Australopithecus, etc., Agaster, Homo techniensis, the new form of the species of the Homo genus that is going to be emerging, with which in a way we're already sharing the planet. And I think the, 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 the nature of the reason AI, I think, is so interesting is there's not a facet of our lives that it doesn't touch in some way or another, potentially. Um, and I wanted to think, therefore, about the area of life which matters so much in our lives, which is work. And as I was researching this, um, I was reminded of a book um, called Working by Studs Terkel. And if people don't know it, um, I've been referencing it um, quite a lot in when I talk. And Terkel was a, uh, a, born in a Russian Jewish immigrant family. Uh, coming to America at the beginning of the 20th century. He was a journalist who lived in Chicago most of his life. Um, he was a broadcaster, a radio broadcaster. And he did a, 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 an astonishingly beautiful set of interviews with people describing their working lives and describing the meaning they found in their working lives. And there's a, uh, there's a nice quote. Um, he quotes... Uh, Bertolt Brecht, um, um, which is a uh, Bertolt Brecht's Who Built the Seven Towers of Thebes? The books are filled with the names of kings. Was it kings who hauled the craggy blocks of stone? In the evening, when the Chinese wall was finished, where did the masons go? And this is uh, from a, um, uh, a steel worker um, who he interviewed. And I'm not romanticizing the work of the steel worker. He was a guy called Mike Lefebvre. It's the first interview. 
And I was reading this, and he described what he does with, uh, in his job. And I'm not going to attempt a Pittsburgh Steel accent, so he's going to get a more cut-glass English accent. I hope he forgives me. Um, and he says, it's not just the work. Somebody built the pyramids. Somebody's going to build something. Pyramids, Empire State Building, these things just don't happen. There's hard work behind it. I would like to see a building, say the Empire State, I'd like to see on one side of it a foot-wide strip from top to bottom with the name of every bricklayer, the name of every electrician, with all the names. So when a guy walked by, he could take his son and daughter and say, see, that's me over there on the 45th floor. I put that steel beam in. Picasso can, paint to a paint, can point to a painting. What can I point to? A writer can point to a book. Everybody should have something to point to. And I think I read that because I, I got into a bit of a spat at a conference recently with a very wealthy hedge fund manager who was talking about all the automation that's coming down the road and about all these dull jobs that it's going to be fabulous when they're going to get automated out. And these were jobs this person had never done in his life. And I think we need to be maybe a lot more aware of the carelessness with which we talk about some of this automation. And without romanticizing work that can be very difficult, one of the things we're going to talk a lot about as a family is the nature of human judgment and decision making. And one of the things that my, my mother created was a thing called Career Path Appreciation uh, when she founded the company BIOS in its commercial form. And it's a, a way of having a conversation with people about how they make decisions and come to judgments through their working lives, particularly in the face of complexity and uncertainty. And we've had about 150,000 of these conversations around the world with everybody from Aboriginal men and women in Australia, mine workers in KwaZulu um, in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, and out of that has come a deep respect for and an understanding of the way in which every one of us longs to be able to use our judgment. And it's that emerging space between human judgment and work and what data in its various instantiations, of which obviously AI is one, and what that emerging judgment decision-making boundary space looks like, what it looks like for accountabilities and authorities in organizations. So I think a lot of it is, is, is how do we manage, make sure that we treat people as people, not as so many data points, and how we look to deepen and, and honor human capability, not to impoverish it, and how we put the capability of, 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 of people at the heart of how we manage our relationship with AI. And there's a theme, I think, that's run through all of our work, which is how do you create institutions in the wider society which maximize the constructive aspects of human nature and minimize the destructive? And I think there's a fascinating paradox that we're all living with now, which is how we have these working relationships with non-human things which don't feel, they don't feel pain, and therefore they can't be sanctioned. And for me, that's an absolutely critical boundary space. And I just want to kind of lock off one one area about the feeling of pain, and it would be like go back to Marvin and, and the sense of paranoia. If you imagine a time in your life when there was an emotion which was maybe a rather difficult emotion, um, it was the pain of grief, bereavement, unrequited love, road rage, maybe a time where you were behaving in a way which you weren't desperately proud of at that moment, and you certainly weren't proud of afterwards. And then, as I say, ask yourself, do you ever want genuinely paranoid AI, even if that were technically feasible to create something which felt, I think the other way of locking that off would be to say it's one thing to deal with 3.8 billion years of chemically substrate evolved evolution and pain. It's another to engineer it into a system, even if that were possible, in order to manage this relationship and potentially have things screaming at clock speeds in the dark in guilt, shame, pain, remorse in ways unimaginable to us. And I think that would be ethically monstrous. So we've got this paradox. How do we manage the relationship with non-human actors, but, but things which are clearly acting and having power in relationship to ourselves? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just as a thought experiment, I found it quite interesting. I've been doing quite a lot of work thinking about what language you, you maybe can and can't or shouldn't use to describe AI, and, and Dekai has just arrived, and one of the world's leading experts on natural language parsing from Hong Kong. <laughs> and we've had this kind of conversation about, about language and the morphology of language. And it's very interesting to think about words that we, we do regularly ascribe to AI as AI having power, having authority, having agency, uh, learning. 
And then there's maybe a, 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 a midsection of words that, um, and I'm talking in English here, which reciprocity, could you have a reciprocal relationship? Could you have a mutual relationship with AI? And then maybe words which we need to be quite careful about not using, like accountable, for example. An AI cannot be accountable because you can't sanction it, it doesn't feel. And it's just quite an interesting sort of way of thinking when you hear language which you maybe feel think is sort of straying into the anthropomorphization to think about what language groupings we can usefully use to describe the relationships we have with AI. I, I often tell a story of, 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 Douglas tells a story of a puddle which wakes up one morning and looks at the hole that it's in and thinks to itself, this hole fits me very neatly. In fact, this hole fits me so neatly, it must have been made especially for me and the puddle continues to think that the hole was made especially for it as the sun comes up and the puddle evaporates. And that was Douglas's plea for a little bit more humility on behalf of Homo sapiens in believing that we're the apogee of cognition, perception, and intelligence. And again, I think that's something that's really interesting to take away and think about, the notion of different forms of perception, that we, 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 we have our own perceptual fields, the way we hear, the way we see, the way we think, the way we think about time, um, the benches, everything around us, they look solid, but from another perspective, if we were to see it, there would be this buzzing of quantum effects. So we, we have our perceptual fields, but one of the things that I think AI does is open up other perceptual fields. Now, I've been situating this within a, within a human space, and um, I just want to read something which I read recently, because it was a, a paper that really made me think hard. It was a paper written by um, uh, somebody from the Cree Nation, somebody from the Lakota Nation, and somebody from Hawaii. And they were situating our relationship with AI within an indigenous people's epistemology, the way that, the, the, the way that they view and see the world, which isn't necessarily the way we've come to see the world through Western eyes. And he quotes a Blackfoot philosopher, Leroy Little Bear, observing that the human brain is a station on the radio dial parked in one spot. It is deaf to all the other stations, the animals, rocks, trees, simultaneously broadcasting across the whole spectrum of sentience. And I think thinking about these things in terms of these relationships. And so we're going to talk about the nature of governance, and what governance in organizations and the wider society looks like in terms of these emerging relationships. Um, the word governance comes from the Greek word kybernine, which means to take the helm of a ship, to steer a ship. It's about emergence and being with uncertainty. It's not about compliance and all those other things that boards get trapped into. So we're going to be dropping artificial intelligence into the complex mix of people and purpose, strategy and ethics, values, unintended consequence. And human affairs are messy and our relationship with AI will be full of contradictions and messiness too. So the question we're going to be exploring is, not is intelligent like us, or is it ethical, but a simpler, more pragmatic question, what's the work? What's the work AI does? So I think I've been gonged out, um, and I'm just going to quickly, my daughter works at Entrepreneur First, which is a, uh, a, an organization which helps people who've made me decided to have a, a, a different kind of path from the McKinsey's paths, uh, the, the traditional organizations, sort of they invest in talent at a very early stage, early domain talent to build high tech, deep tech companies. And Olivia looks after their community world, uh, the community worldwide. Sam works at Freeformers, which is uh, the commercial director there. It's a company deeply concerned with people at the front line of organizations and their skills and their mindset in terms of being with some of the challenges that they're asked to face in their own work and caring deeply that we don't you know, just see this at the, the, the elite levels of organizations. My mother, um, uh, so I run the company that, uh, that Gillian founded. Um, and Gillian's work, I think, is life's work has been around thinking about how people work together, the nature of working relationships. Um, she has uh, thought deeply with leaders of very, very large organizations um, as a sounding board as they think through some of the complexity of the challenges that they have in their working lives. Uh, and so deep interest in the nature of complexity and uncertainty and judgment in complex environments. So that's the family, and I'm now going to hand over to Olivia. Thank you. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> um, 
Well, thank you very much uh, for setting the tone for a lot of the themes that I think we'd really like to explore in a lot more detail. Uh, as uh, Robbie, that's going to be a weird one, I'm not calling him dad, but I'll try my best, um, touched on, uh, I think one of the hopefully unique things about this discussion or is the fact that it will be a conversation. Um, a genuine glimpse into a stamp family Sunday. We hope that means none of us are coming with a particular agenda, but more that we can leave you with some potentially new thoughts about what it really does mean to be a human at work. Um, coming at that from uh, three generations of a family means obviously we can come with a number of different perspectives from different uh, times and different geographies. Um, but we're also very aware that the fact that we are a family means that there may well be a number of shared perspectives, a shared background and shared set of conversations and experiences that, that mean that we're all on this stage today and that have led all of us to explore in our work and to really focus uh, our own careers on what it means to be human at work. Uh, the general structure that we'd like to follow is kind of unpacking what that really means, uh, exploring the, the three generational part of that, um, exploring what does it mean to be human at work at all, uh, let alone within tech. Um, but obviously we are at an AI conference and so we would like to bring AI back into that conversation once we have tackled the rather large question of we're not going to go for what it is to be human. I think that's slightly too large for a 40 minute conversation. Um, but what it is to be human at work. Uh, and I think what I'd really like to start with is that generational piece. So Sam and I are millennials um, at the relative uh, early stages for me especially a beginning of our careers uh, and it can feel like a uniquely scary uncertain time to be starting a career and to be starting to work uh, we don't know if we're going to be working till we're a hundred uh, we don't know if the world is going to end in the next 20 years uh, and I would love to initially start with your thoughts uh, Gillian again a strange one um, on whether that sense of uncertainty and that sense of what, what does it mean to be human at work um, is, is a unique conversation that is happening now. How different does it actually feel at this stage for you at the end of your career? Or are there consistent themes that you have seen throughout your career in thinking about in those, those, yeah, that, that sense of what it actually means to be working? Um, right, if I start by saying that my, my working life has been completely dedicated to listening to other people talk about their working lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm much better at listening to people talking about their working lives than I am about talking generally. Um, but I would, uh, I suppose what I've learned, which is uh, responding specifically to Olivia's question, is that most people, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to talk to people in different kinds of organizations, in different parts of the world, at all sorts of different levels in organizations. And what they will say in various languages, in various ways, is that above all, they want to be treated at work as if they are a human, human being. And in various times when I've tried to write papers and taken that quote so that you have the word human followed over twice, it has always been struck out by <laughs> editors. <laughs> And I've had to remind them each time that that is what people say. Um, and what that seems to mean, and it seems to mean to people who are working uh, in what sometimes are very automated um, circumstances, and I appreciate completely that those have changed, but I'd like to, if this time I'll come back to that. People who, are, who have extensive responsibilities, uh, people who are working in financial services, in mining, in religious organizations, in governments. What they most of all long to do, which Olivia has touched on, is to use their judgment at work. They're perfectly happy to have people describe to them what it is that's expected of them, what resources are available, all those kind of things. But what they want above all is to have an element of their work where they need to use what I think of as their capability. And that's the quality that we all turn to when we do not and we cannot know what to do. Uh, we may have enormous expertise, uh, considerable experience, 
uh, understanding, but there is a longing to use something deeper within us, as in addition to our knowledge and our experience, which is about, and Olivia was touching on this earlier in a conversation, about there being shades of grey, and I appreciate the phrase, um, in terms of what it is that they can bring that is specifically themselves to whatever the work that they need to do. If people are constrained and completely unable to use their judgment, quite apart from it not being human, uh, the whatever organization they work for simply does not gain from them the value, the, their development, uh, because it, the organization has no access to their imagination, their creativity, all the things that they can offer if, if they're um, allowed, if they're given a proper space in which to use their judgment. The other um, sort of side of that that I've learned is that people, again, in all these very different settings, have a very clear sense of the conditions in which they are best able to use their judgment. They're very clear that if they know what is expected of them and they know what resources are and they know how what is expected of them or, what, or rather what they will do will make a contribution to whatever the overall purpose of the organization, whether it's huge or small or medium scale, if they, so in other words, if in the language that I tend to use, if they know they're tasked properly, if they feel that their judgment is being trusted and they're being respected to use this creative human side of themselves, and if they are tended, in other words, there is a sense that there's someone around, their manager, their immediate leader, who isn't endlessly looking over their shoulder or asking questions of them, but is there as uncertainty unfolds, which it inevitably does in any kind of project at work. Because obviously the background to all this is again, Robbie was touching on and um, Olivia was touching on, uh, is that the whole point about exercising judgment is that it makes it possible to live with uncertainty as possibility. So uncertainty is something uh, around which you can begin to think, rather than seeing uncertainty purely as something that makes one anxious and ill at ease, uh, it allows space for imagination and space for seeing the future in a different kind of way. Can I just ask a quick question there as well? So we work, uh, me and Olivia both work, but I work particularly in quite a small startup where it is much easier to allow people to use their judgment because their roles are slightly less defined and everyone's having to make lots of decisions all the time and you can't possibly say, well, this is just the one lane that I want you to be in. But, and you read about it a lot, the moment an organization gets slightly bigger and the moment that they have slightly more responsibility or more clients and people start having to be put in lanes because it's the classic Fordian way of structuring. I don't trust everyone, I don't know everyone, I can't trust them, so management up top decides that I'll put lots of people in lanes because it's the easier way. Is that... Does, is that necessary for a large organization? Or, or do you think, is it necessary when people don't know everyone? Or does it have to be about like devolved responsibility onto leaders lower than an organization who are able to do that management? Because that's the other thing that we always come across is that middle management are often the, a big issue in how you help people use their judgment because they're judged on things that are much more concrete about people doing X, Y, and Z, which feels like it's easier to just force them to do it and task them specifically rather than let people use their judgment. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think my response to that is probably to just very briefly uh, describe um, a situation which um, uh, arose in an, uh, a very large insurance organization based in Hong Kong which had for a long time been owned by um, an American insurance um, business which allowed no judgment of any kind uh, at any level in any of the 17, 17 Southeast Asian countries in which this organization operated. This organization was taken to an IPO and the decision was made by the chief executive who took it to the IPO that he would empower the decision making of all the country markets. Now these country markets range from South Korea to Thailand to Malaysia to wherever. Uh, and it was a very brave decision to make because quite obviously neither he nor his executive team in Hong Kong knew these people. He couldn't know them. But he set out quite clearly aware of the risks, understanding just how delicate it was to trust the judgment of those people. 
uh, and delicately to, or and sometimes quite uh, strongly, um, to uh, to develop them, to train them, to make clear what, what their expectations were of them. So it can be done. I mean, that was done at a distance. Many of those people were a long way away from Hong Kong. Um, but there was a very clear message about the points we've just been making, about the importance of judgment. Uh, and the consequences were very positive, to put it mildly, in terms, in purely commercial terms, but more importantly, well, from my point of view, more importantly, uh, for the people who had that opportunity to, to be human, and to be human in very different cultures. Can I add something that, that I, I'd also noticed? I, I, I'd, um, one of the things, it was something, something Janine was saying just then, uh, a little earlier, about people being watched and that how you genuinely create that space in which there is the space for people to make their, and exercise their judgment. And I was, I was reading, again, I was reading the Studs Terkel, and I was very struck by uh, something he wrote in his introduction um, where he was talking um, about people feeling, being anxious about being spied on. And he was talking about that being something that was, uh, was something, this is a book that's written in 1974, and it's a theme of being spied on. And I think one of the things that worries me a lot about some of the current new generation of the way in which people try and be with the issue that Sam just raised of, of, of what it means like, what it means when if you think about dependencies in organizations, in a way, we, we tend to think of the board as that's, that's, that's the top dogs, but actually, they're the most dependent organ in the body because they're dependent on lots of work for which they aren't directly responsible, they're accountable for it. And in that dependency, I think all sorts of sort of processes get put in place where when things go wrong, then your automatic sense is, well, you've got to drive things back hard and take back control, as opposed to being with that much more dynamic way of creating the space for judgment and decision-making. Now, I think one of the things that's happened with a lot of the new people analytics, which are being AI-driven, is I think a lot of this stuff hasn't just come up to a borderline and said, that looks a bit like surveillance. They've left it long ago in their rearview mirror. I and mean, if you're doing things like sentiment analysis, if you're tracking people around a building, if you're, you know, you're reading their emails, you're even now starting to take their vital signs and you're starting to look at you know, oxytocin and serotonin reactions to certain kinds of situations. And I think it's next to impossible at the moment to have a realistic informed consent in that space. What does informed consent even look like? And so just one example around, I think, a danger that AI brings to trying to deal with the issue we've just been talking about is another way of trying to control it through monitoring. But just one quick thought experiment. We all have a complete signature on the way we use a trackpad. Uh, uh, somebody could tell that it was Sam, somebody could, tell it was, somebody could tell it was me using a trackpad. An algorithm could say, oh, that's Robbie using his trackpad. I was talking to somebody the other day about what we start to discover with inference patterns of data, and you start to discover that actually somebody's maybe got the early stages of Parkinson's, probabilistic correlative data. Now, who owns that data? Where does that data go first? So I think a lot of organizations in the people analytics space have got some... I think, I think again, there's a sense that, ha, oh, here's a new technology which will allow us to sort of control, to keep an eye, to watch, drive productivity, but I think we need to be very, very careful because I think that there's a lot of distortion being driven by money going very quickly into systems which uh, are, as I say, I think they're just borderline surveillance. I think they are already surveillance in organizations. And there's a huge asymmetry of power here in organizations because who is setting up the systems which are, which are doing these forms of surveillance? And who owns and where does the power sit? In? And I think that's a, a critical issue. And I think the danger, if one doesn't use AI to, again, think about how you develop capability, develop this space where people exercise their judgment, is it becomes another form of control and another way of trying to sort out that issue that you, you raised. Absolutely. And I think it would be great to hear more from you, Sam, on that point around your work at the moment and how that fits into that context of capability and allowing people to better use their judgment, not only in a sense of necessarily a particular job, but thinking maybe more holistically about a career and, and how that fits into 
Yeah, I, I think what, what, we, what we do is quite interesting. And I, so I, I worked in advertising before, and then I, the reason I joined Freeform is where I work, which helps, it's called the Future Workforce Company. We help people develop the skills they need so that they can keep a job in the future. And I was Googling loads of different things because I decided I want to leave advertising. And I was like, how comically lucky is it that I can choose what I want to do next with all of the privilege that comes with being able to sit on a stage like this and everything. And I thought there's going to be a whole load of people who don't get to have any of that. Um, and that got me really thinking that maybe the thing that I could spend most of my time working on is how can I share some of the stuff that I'm able to do. And that led me to Freeformers. And a lot of the work we do is with big frontline organizations. So the Studs Turkel work is quite appropriate for us. Um, and one of the big things that we're trying to do something that we generally think is quite positive, which is basically helping people to help each other. So create champion networks and organizations, and then they, you know, some people who are further ahead train their colleagues. But we get huge resistance to at basically every level of it. So whether you're trying to sell into a board who believe that there's relevance, but then they're like, but we don't really have a budget for helping the future of work. But then if you attach it to a digital transformation budget, which is, well, an organization says, there's so much amazing stuff we can do to cut costs and automate things. Let's spend lots of money on it. Then you get loads of blockers from people who feel like it's, well, now you're just helping me, you know, turkeys for Christmas, helping me to train so that I can lose my own job. And then if you get to people when you're actually on the front line talking to them, then they too often feel like it's something else to add to their to-do list when they've got so many other things to do and they're being tasked with so many other things and recognized and met, like given performance reviews on loads of other things that aren't how are they developing as themselves. And I think that the, the thing that I both love and we, you know, we come at it sometimes from different angles of like, is the what, what do you actually do? Like, and that's why the, the big enterprise sales organizations that you, know, both, you guys are both able to talk you know, at a much higher level to people in companies. And then we get stuck in the weeds of, okay, so we know that people are important and AI is important. What, we don't know where to start or what to do next. And I think that, that that's the thing that, you know, often when we have these conversations, they sometimes come to an end where you're like, well, yeah, it's a big question. I don't know quite where you do start. <laughs> um, so hopefully in front of everyone, we don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> so that's it, yeah. But it, that, I think that's, that's like where do, and, and can you sell someone on the benefits of the fact that your trackpad can tell you that you've got Parkinson's? Like, is that good? Does someone want that? Is that something that you can, you know, can you go to someone and say, don't worry, if you do X, Y, or Z, or you let us track you when you walk upstairs, you're going to get 10 pounds off your vitality health insurance. Like, maybe that is great, but I, I, and I, I won't do a sort of a diatribe, but we, we did a lot of work with a lot of banks on PSD2, the Payment Services Directive, open banking, some of you guys might have heard of it, and people were sold on the idea that you could have integrated systems across your right move so that you could be pre-approved for a mortgage when you were viewing a house, or you could see all of your expenditure in one go, and no one cares. Like, and even Monzo, who are the forefront of all of this, their API isn't even open yet, so they haven't even done it. So the benefits aren't actually coming to the people. Um, and so uh, my, my question, I suppose, to all of it is how, when you actually talk about, th about this to a person who is working, what is the, what's the way in? How do you tell someone that it's, it's worth their, do you just appeal to their sense of humanity and long living? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, um, I can't reply directly in the way I should be able to. But what you make me think of is that very often when, you, when I start or when others start, as Sam is describing, to try and speak with people who have extensive responsibilities about treating people as people, uh, it becomes quite helpful to describe to them or to remind them that people are makers. They are makers of decisions and they are makers of meaning. And they're makers in the sense that, this, as you know, the Scottish word for a poet is a maker. So that's one of the things that people are. People are also members. Um, and and people, oh, I'm sorry, and they're also makers of meaning. They need always to, to make meaning because that's the way people are. Um, they are also members of um, groups, professional groups, teams, families, communities, and all the rest of it. Uh, and. Then comes the real difficulty, which I think is, addresses Sam's point, which is that when you really genuinely start to try to treat people as, or a person as if he or she was a person, you discover very quickly that they are an irreducible mystery, at which point most managers and leaders just say, right, that's it. 
<laughs> there's no way. I've tried. I've, I've done everything. I've been respectful, et cetera, et cetera. I've understood the creativity. But it, this person is, is beyond me. And I was talking about this one day um, in, a, in a workshop. Um, and someone said to me, would you like another M? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I can tell you that treating people as people is messy. And the man beside him said, ah, oh, yes, but it's magic. And it's helping leaders or managers to stay with, to go through the mystery bit, to put up with the messiness, and then they get to the magic, where they, because people have been treated as people, they will work differently, not in the sense, I mean, the worst way one could think, as, as I said it, I was thinking, it sounds as if managers simply set out to exploit people. It isn't, in my experience, generally the case. The, uh, in the private sector, quite obviously and reasonably, work is done in order to make money for shareholders because that's how that particular aspect of capitalism works. But there are many other settings in the public sector where the work is essentially uh, for the sake of taxpayers, if you like, and funded in that way. So uh, the whole question of <laughs> just being, allowing people to be people and understanding that people long to work and they long to use their judgment and they long to work with others in cooperative ways. But as um, I was discussing with someone the other day, it is amazing to me in a way how well some organizations do manage to function and do manage to treat their people and allow their people to be people. And when it does happen, as anybody who's worked in a setting like that, it just makes all the difference to how people feel about going into work, what they feel about themselves, um, and, and et cetera. Can I, one super quick thing. You got a real insight into a stamp family conversation there when Gillian said, maker, as you will know, <laughs> it means poet in Scottish, which is like a classic when you say, you will know, of course, what the poet more Marcus Aurelius said, or which obviously no one has ever, ever heard of. But we all nod along. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess what I, I want to then see. then lead on to from that given that people are magic and messy and so many some organizations can get it right but so many others don't i guess to to bring in the ai into the conversation and i know you think a lot a lot about that framework of how how on earth can you come up with a coherent framework for working with ai if working with people is so difficult in itself well, I think we can use some of the, some of the thinking that we do. I mean, and, and, and again, let's give you an example of, of kind of why, why it matters. And it's, maybe it's a, a couple of quick thought experiments, which I think are quite helpful to, to start to, to think about how you contextualize some of what we've been talking about within these new working relationships. So let's imagine a situation where, and this is a, this is a, a, a real life situation, um, which is, uh, I was talking to a chief data scientist at the Ministry of Justice, and we were talking about an AI that uh, is put into the prison system to determine which uh, cells are going to be shared by who. So this is a piece of work that we would, we would say is one critical category for thinking about AI work, which is that it is advisory. So the work the AI does, that's a useful framing. What's the work? The work is that it is advisory. It's advisory, and it leaves space for human judgment and decision-making. So here's the thought experiment. It's been operating well for a couple of years, and one day a senior prison officer takes a uh, new prisoner down to meet her cellmate for the first time. And in the moments of introduction, something tells her something's up. This doesn't feel right. What happens next is where this whole AI ethics governance relationship space lives or dies. So does she go back to the governor and the governor says, Mary, it's you, get her out now. Does, Mary say, does the governor say to Mary, Mary, thank you very much, mention it at the team meeting, we'll all keep a close eye. Does the governor say, Mary, I need more than a feeling. Look, the number's 25% reduction in violence, I need more than a feeling. Maybe worst of all, does Mary, the prison officer, not say anything? Does she not trust to her judgment anymore? So she then goes home, and maybe she does come in the next day, and some poor new prisoner has been beaten up. So it's, it's that, even something as simple as is the work advisory, is it leaving room for judgment and decision-making? One quick other one to think about, and I won't go through all of it because it would take up too much time, but the other one we think about a lot is authority. So what's the authority in a moment? So again, a thought experiment for this. So I don't really mind how far in the future it is, 
whether it's 10 or 15 years, a car crash victim in a very bad way, multiple organ trauma, broken bones. They were hypertensive and diabetic before they were hit by the car. A surgeon has been operating on them for an hour and a half, and the looks like you're going to lose the patient. She's going to bleed out. You've got minutes to make a decision about what procedure you're going to do next. And the surgeon, a very experienced surgeon, she thinks she should do one thing. A sophisticated AI has been monitoring the vital signs and recommends a different procedure. In that moment, who has the authority? Who has the authority in that moment? So you could say the rules of engagement are, we never, the hospital says, we never put a human being, a surgeon, in a situation where she has to perform a new procedure for which she's not prepped. Somebody else could say, well, the, the procedure that's being recommended is a procedure that the surgeon doesn't know about because the machine has been talking to a network of machines like it around the world. And this is a gold standard procedure trialed in Shenzhen, Seoul, and Hanoi, which is for precisely this combination of trauma and precondition that this surgeon has never met before. Now who should have the authority? So either way, if the patient dies, there's one key difference. If you go with the surgeon, the surgeon is accountable. If you go with the machine and the patient dies, the machine could be liable. It could require insurance. The hospital could require it to have insurance, but it can't be accountable because you can't meaningfully sanction it. So this is some of the ways that we start to think about the nature of this working relationship, to think about things like authority, where it sits in any particular situation. So is that, how is that different to a more senior doctor? Like, could you just put it in the, as a more senior doctor, who has the call? The person in the room is the person that's the most senior or has the most experience or has the best, and then, therefore, the lines of, obviously, it can't be accountable, and, you know, the, the machine isn't going to go home and cry because some, they did something wrong. Could you just apply the same logic? Well, I think, I think for me, that is the, the, the accountability piece is the boundary. Because I think, I think for me, that, that key thing, because the machine doesn't feel pain, therefore it can't be sanctioned, and therefore it can't be accountable in any human system we've yet devised around ethics or, or, or secular... Unless, just, un just, uh, unless you say that the person who's accountable is the person who decided the higher... Like, if my boss makes a bad decision, it's the person who put the boss there is fault. Like the board, right? As in, it's, it's the person... It's, it's, a, it's a matter of governance. Who, who made the decision to bring the AI, whatever it is, in, in the first place? That's where the accountability yes. is. Yes. It, it has to sit with the board. It has to sit with the board or the, the minister um, in, that, in, in that situation. It will, you know, if something goes wrong... In a hospital, there's a scandal, there's a sort of series of things which have gone on which were seen to be advice or, or, or lack of clarity around authority in those moments, and suddenly you're dealing with very distressed families, and the minister is standing up in the house. At that moment, she or he is every bit as accountable for the work as if it had been done by a human being. So that accountability piece, I think, is an absolutely critical boundary. Well, in a way, yes as if it had been done by a human being. But the point is that the decision has been made by someone else that some kind of an AI will do that piece of work. Mm. That's where the responsibility and accountability lie. Mm. Not the decision, the decision to introduce another way of working. And as you said earlier, often a very much wider range of experience and knowledge. But the decision to bring in is a governance decision. And that's why, why it's become so very important that governance that people think about governance and ethics in relation to all this. And I guess something that interests me there is the understanding. So who, if, can you introduce AI into an organization? I'm sure there are many people who do, who just don't understand it. They don't comprehend, they may, they may be able to get to the stage where they do understand the work that it is doing, but they have no idea how it's doing the work that it's doing. And do, do any of you have thoughts on either, how, well, is that a huge issue? Um, and if it is, then how can we start to go about making sure that people understand what they're about to introduce into their organization? Yes. Yeah, I mean, def it definitely is an issue. Um, and I, I think I, I just had a meeting with the RSA earlier, and they were talking about how they'd 
done some citizen juries recently with, you know, sort of deliberative democracy stuff around introducing AI into the British court system, in fact. And the more people learnt about it, the less happy they were with machines making decisions, even if it made the decision more accurate, because people like their day in court or like the idea that... So, I, I, and I think that the reality is, and this is very much freeformers' angle on most tech stuff, you only need to know a little bit to begin to know the right questions to ask. And it is completely unrealistic to expect boards or C-suite or anyone in an organization to become like an expert in any of these things, in part because the moment they become an expert in whatever the latest machine learning stuff is, it will be something new. Um, so I, I don't think that, but it's, they need to somehow find a way of being surrounded by people who can offer them advice. And I guess it's also trying to avoid the magical thinking that there is a tech solution that will solve the problem because the decision can be made that used to be hard, but now a machine knows how to do it because Alexa told it to. Then, I, And I think that that's probably, you need to let people remember that it's really hard and that they can't just get an easy way out. Could I... Gillian, but to think to think a little bit about uncertainty, because obviously that's been a very much sort of what, what the nature of uncertainty and the shifting boundaries that you see around uncertainty in, is in relation to that kind of an issue. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'd, I'd go, go back for a moment um, and just think about because I think in many ways. The sense is that we live in a very uncertain and a very complex world, um, and but of course that's of course that's the case. Um, but in many ways, it, it probably no, let me start again. In many ways, it is less. No, people have become very anxious about uncertainty, and as I was saying earlier, when people are in a position where they're able to use their judgment they can be much calmer about um, recognizing uncertainty and recognizing that if there wasn't uncertainty, there would be no point whatsoever in making decisions um, because everything would be settled and, and things would just plan out as they, as, they, as they happen. So the whole point about uncertainty is that it offers us opportunity. The difficulty is that in many cases what organizations try to do when handling uncertainty is they introduce um, scenario planning, various forms of probabilistic assumptions about the various things that may happen. And then once you do that, and probabilistic assumptions, as you know, are, can be very complicated from a mathematical point of view, but they have one characteristic, which is that the, the outcome must always end in a single, uh, in unity. So in other words, you can't have what mathematicians call a residual hypothesis. You can't say, okay, there are five paths here, but there might be others. Probability doesn't allow you to do that. The way to think about uncertainty in terms of its potential is to think about it as possibility. So then it becomes a matter of imagination, of creativity, of different ways in which things might be done. It doesn't mean that that possibility is completely unbounded, but you don't constrain it in the way that you do when you think about uncertainty as probability. There was a very creative and unusual economist, a man called George Shackle, who was one of the first people to write about um, thinking about uncertainty in this way. And he came up with this really lovely phrase. He described strategy as the imagined deemed possible. So the whole question of using imagination and then deeming, in other words, making a decision about what is possible, both in the circumstances that prevail at the moment and in, in terms of using uncertainty as a resource. And I suppose that's one of the things that I spend a lot of my time doing, is being with people who have very extensive responsibilities as they think about how to use uncertainty as a resource and how to do that in such a way that it becomes an energy for the organization that they lead rather than a source of anxiety and, and concern. Um, so if you just shift from probability to possibility, it open, well, it opens up a whole poetic future, quite apart from the commercial future or the <laughs> government future or whatever. And I think, oh, sorry. I'll just, as we're coming into our, our final few minutes, I think that that very much, for me, leads on to something that we talked about a lot as a 
core way of thinking about all of these things. And I love the idea of the poetry of maximizing the constructive aspects, which you touched on, and minimizing the destructive. Uh, and that idea of possibility very much is what is an imagination and creativity are all of those things that are best about humans. And that there is a big debate around whether that is something that AI is ever capable of doing. And I wondered if that, if that was maybe what you were going on to, maybe not. <laughs> Very intuitively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I think it was to say that, you know, I, I think, you know, that the, the view of, of, of the thing that's genuinely exciting is the possibility of seeing new patterns, seeing new things. I've taken to sort of asking people who do a lot of work in AI and ML, has there been a time where a pattern correlative, let alone causative, was revealed to you, which was surprising. I mean, I saw a, a, a phenomenal presentation recently in Paris, some of the most beautiful slides, and I don't think I was just as a non-data scientist being lulled by the beauty of the visuals, but it was somebody talking about the pathology of disease and what big data is beginning to show us in terms of disease clusters, which are going to sort of break through being a heart specialist, a lung specialist, a kidney specialist, and to see the way things are much more holistic. So I'd come back to something I talked about a little bit, about perceptual fields, because I think that's genuinely one of the, the most exciting things about AI, is the, the capacity, we, we, you know, we have our senses, but we know that, for example, there's, there's loads of light spectra we don't see, there's frequencies we don't hear, there's s new forms of sense-making and gathering data, and I think that possibility uh, to start to reveal things to us that we haven't seen before. But I, again, talking with somebody about two categories, you've got a category of uncertainty and you've got a category of, well, we know about this stuff. Now, if you take something out of this category and put it over here, that thing may now no longer be uncertain. But the category of uncertainty doesn't go away. And I think sometimes that's a sort of an engineering fallacy, that you can engineer your way out of uncertainty. Uncertainty will always be uncertain. It's its nature. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. And of course it will exist. But I think the exciting thing is this emerging boundary space between new forms of perception and pattern. And that's why that little reference to indigenous people's ontology and epistemology, I think, is interesting. I think it's one of the most exciting areas of AI as we navigate this emerging work relationship between our forms of cognition and embodiment and these other forms of pattern recognition and learning and understanding. So does that potentially come back to answer the question that I sort of asked at the beginning of how do you make this accessible to people? Uh, maybe not necessarily talking about, I mean, describing the poetry and the ontology of AI is awesome, but the opportunity of uncertainty phrased in a slightly different way, as in the opportunity to make a living in a new way, the opportunity, like, opportunity seems more accessible to lots of people. And there's, if you can phrase it, there's always, if everyone's going to need to start working in a space where they're using judgment and uncertainty, like in a bank, if all of the transactional stuff is done via an app, the only thing that HSBC has over Monzo is loads of stores that people can go into. And it's going to be uncertain what people come in and do every day. And if, if that bit can become exciting, perhaps that's the way that you... And then it's just a comms job, and my marketing can come back and be relevant again. <laughs> And I think that is pretty much all we have time for. That's ended on a significantly more positive note than I thought it might, <laughs> um, which is great. But yes, yeah, so I've, I mean, thank you to my family. <laughs> thank you all for listening. I hope we've left you um, with some, some different things to think about. And um, please go and enjoy your evenings. Thank you.